Everyone has a story, and I believe that sharing your story has the power to connect people. I'm a working mom, wife, and seeker, and nothing lights me up and brings me more joy than having meaningful conversations. And one of the things I love to talk about is psychedelics. In December 2021, I experienced my first psychedelic journey with psilocybin. It was one of the most profound events in my life, and it opened me up to a deeper spiritual growth and helped me to heal. And now, talking to those who've experienced the therapeutic magic of psychedelics and hearing about their personal journey has become my passion. Mindful Trip is a safe space to have conversations that demystify and destigmatize the use of plant medicines. Conversations that allow us to have deeper connections with ourselves and others. I hope that sharing these intimate, funny, and inspiring stories helps you find the answers you're looking for. A wise friend said to me, all you can do is follow the threads and see where it takes you. So I hope you'll join me in unraveling the threads, staying open, and trusting the journey. This is Mindful Trip. Mindful Trip content and the views, thoughts, and opinions of the host, guests, and contributors is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional legal advice or medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Consult with the medical provider or mental health care professional about your health-related questions. Mindful Trip does not encourage illegal activity, including but not limited to the illegal sale, purchase, or use of controlled substances. Hi, and thanks for joining. My guest today is Paul Song, Paul shares how his wife, Lisa Ling, encouraged him to begin exploring psychedelics and the deeply emotional and profound ayahuasca journeys that led to healing childhood and generational trauma. Dr. Paul Song is currently CEO and vice chairman of NK Gen Biotech. He is the co-founder and former CEO of Fuse Biotherapeutics, where he still serves as a senior advisor. Your support means a lot, so please subscribe, download, and share with friends and family. I'd also love to hear what resonates for you, so send me your comments. Hi, Paul. Hey, great to be here. So nice to meet you. It's really nice to meet you and really appreciate you reaching out and all the work you're doing to bring attention to, I think, a treatment that can really help a tremendous amount of people. So grateful that you were able to do this. When I started this podcast a few months ago, I made a guest wish list, and you were actually the first person on that wish list. So now I can oh. mark that. I manifested it. So hopefully, after this, I'll be able to get all the other people that I have on that wish list on the podcast. So thank you for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. It's really my pleasure. So let's start off. What was going on in your life that led you to explore psychedelics for therapeutic use? Well, I was in my 50s and I just felt like I was kind of subsisting through life, that there were probably a lot of things in my life that remained unresolved. And I had tried to do standard therapy a couple of years ago and maybe had some incremental breakthroughs, but nothing that was really profoundly life-changing or altering. And I just continued to, I think, operate with the same sort of repression and coping mechanisms that you just evolve with through your life. But I think it was having kids and seeing that I didn't want to pass this generational trauma to my own kids. And that while I was sort of in that last third of your life, I felt that there could be much more meaning and more sort of richness to that if I could really dig deep. So had started to hear about ayahuasca. My wife had actually done a story on how ayahuasca had worked in PTSD, and she really encouraged me to go do it. So it was really one of those things where I just felt like I was at a point in my life, and was this the best life that I could really be living at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, you spoke about generational trauma, which obviously hits home for me too, you know, coming from a Korean background and I'm an immigrant. We moved here when I was five years old. So I'm curious, what was your childhood like and what kind of generational trauma were you dealing with? 
So I am probably a little bit earlier in the immigration cycle in the sense that my mom came to the United States in 1951. Mm. She was actually a refugee during the Korean War. She was in a refugee camp in Pusan and was able to come to the U.S. to go to college. My father came in the late 50s after the war. And I don't think they really fully healed from the trauma of the war. They just moved on and they had to survive and then bring their families here. So I was born in New York City at a time when there were very few Koreans and then grew up in New York and New Jersey. Everyone thinks it's a very cosmopolitan, multicultural city. But back then, there were very, very few Koreans in the 60s and early 70s. So for me growing up, there was a lot of unresolved things that I think I didn't recognize my parents had and how that translated to how they did their parenting, how they interacted with one another. And these are things that you totally forget about as you move through life, but through the process of doing psychedelics, it really uncovered a lot of those things. But for me, I realized that most of my childhood, I didn't remember it and probably little glimpses here and there. But honestly, for probably up until high school, there's very little memory that I have, fond memories of childhood. It was just one of those things where you just were getting by. Mm. <clears throat> well, you know, I have a theory and I've had a couple of friends <clears throat> in this space who've said to me that when you have gaps in your memory, and obviously you could chalk it up to maybe it just wasn't significant enough to cement in your brain in some way, but that there was some level of trauma involved and that's why your brain just kind of shut it down and you don't really remember it. I also have like little gaps in my memory where I'm like, God, I can't remember this long strip of time. Mm -hmm. Like what happened? Was it just not interesting? Was it not important? Absolutely. I, I think probably from the age of one till 14, I have very, very few memories, or I had very few memories until I went back and started to do several journeys. Wow. So you said that your wife did a story about ayahuasca psychedelics. So what was your next step being a doctor? Did you end up doing all your research and due diligence before, or did you just kind of dive in? I really wanted to understand more of the scientific rationale behind it because I do think of myself as very much rooted in science and facts and being an oncologist, it was very important for me to sort of understand what was behind why people were having the breakthroughs they were having. So, you know, I did do some research, even though <clears throat> when you do a journey, they do recommend you not read too many things online, that you kind of go into it with sort of a, a clean mind and sort of <clears throat> agnostic. But for me, it was very important. And I was able to understand how the active ingredient of the plant medicines was DMT, dimethyltryptamine, and how that worked on the serotonin inhibitors. And all of that from medical school started to come back. And I was really able to understand sort of the rationale of how these could work. And then it was also a lot of the holistic aspects of that. And I will say I lost my dad to cancer about 15 years ago. And as he was passing away, and despite the fact that I had practiced oncology for many, many years, I really started to question traditional medicine mm -hmm. in the sense that the approaches that we had seemed to be somewhat crude yeah. versus looking at sort of the holistic whole body, whether it be the immune system, which we now recognizes a big part of cancer therapy. But but before it was just, let's poison the tumor or radiate it or cut it out before yeah. you kill the actual patient. Yeah. In much the same way, I think a lot of the way we deal with mental illness in our society, whether it be depression, whether it be bipolar disorder, lots of different things, is to use medication to basically numb the whole mind, right? To turn off something to keep the rest of the body going. And I don't think that's really proven to be really effective over all these years, right? And they don't get to the root problem. So for me, it was really important. I never thought of myself as somebody who was depressed or had mental health issues, and I still don't. But I do think that how I operated towards relationships, whether it be my mom or my sister or my wife or kids, a lot of those things just continue to come out in ways that you just don't understand yeah. until you do these journeys. So growing up culturally, 
we can both speak about growing up in a traditional Korean household. Was your coping mechanism just to completely shut down and just repress your emotions and push forward and not address it, not talk about it? Is that how you essentially operated in the world? It's really interesting. <clears throat> As I've met other Asian Americans, particularly Korean Americans who have gone through this journey, it really depends on what year they were born because some of my friends who were younger had parents who were very emotionally effusive and they had really incredible relationships with. But I find that many of the people that were sort of my generation older, their parents didn't know how to express emotion either. And if they did, it was usually just lashing out. But for me, my parents didn't tell me they loved me until I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And my mom has a master's degree in early childhood education from Columbia University. So you would think that a lot of this social emotional aspect was something that she studied. And yet when it came to my sister and I, she didn't really translate that to her own kids. I subsequently realized through the journeys what was behind that. Again, the trauma of the war. And then my father was a gentleman. I think I might have heard him raise his voice once or twice in my entire life, but he never was capable of showing emotion. I was telling this to one of my friends as recently as last week in that probably in my entire childhood, if you took all of the minutes of the day that we actually spent time having a meaningful conversation, probably for the first 20 years of my life, that's probably less than one week total. Mm. There would be times where I may said two or three words to him in a day. So you operate on just sort of raising yourself. Sure, they provided food and shelter and never had any needs in the world. They were successful enough to provide. But I do think that with regard to my childhood, there was none of that. Then you couple that with a time of a lot of racism, a lot of bullying, being the only Asian kid in your elementary school, and then nobody even knowing what Korean was. Back then, you were either Chinese or Japanese because no one heard of any other Asian ethnic group. So it was a lot of self-reliance. It was a lot of no emotional support at home, a lot of just bearing down and just trying to do your best. And my father, the one thing he did say to us was, even when I would get into fights, he would be so disappointed in me because he'd be like, you're not here to fight back. You're here to just put your head down, keep quiet and, and work hard. Right. That whole model minority stereotype is just such a detriment to every single Asian American. It really is. I have to tell you, I relate to every single thing that you said. My parents there was no demonstration physically of love. There was never any verbal cues of love. They never said, I love you to me or my two sisters until we were well into our adulthood. And just like you said, it was all about just work hard, do well in school, keep your head down, don't make waves. It's just such a typical Asian immigrant mentality. It's like, there's no emotional intelligence. It's so difficult to grow up in that. And then as an adult, we're like, oh my God, I've been stunted for so long. <laughs> Absolutely. And you think about, uh, sadly, you and I are not in the minority that no. I think if you were to poll most Asian Americans or at least Korean Americans, I can only speak for the Korean American community in the sense that a lot of my friends who I've talked to experienced similar upbringings, just how dysfunctional our childhoods were. I will say this, you have to put it in perspective of what was there upbringing childhood like and what was the cultural norm of that but i'm just saying operating in a society where that is so against what your friends in school experienced or how they were being raised it's natural to, to say that i remember my sister came home one day and she was so dejected because so many of her friends would go on these lunch dates with their moms and they were like best friends and she said something to my mom and my mom said i'm not your friend i'm your mom and I think that was something now my mom really regretted. But at the time, that's all she was aware of. But I do think that that's why I think it's so important, the work that you're doing with this podcast is to help our community ultimately find a way to heal yeah. for themselves so they don't repeat generational trauma to their own kids. And for me, I kind of got to a place where I was very functional 
I think some of the independence and needing to be independent as a child fueled me to do the things that I've been able to do. But it was only when I had my own kids and my mom, who lives two blocks away and is over almost every night for dinner, would start to nitpick the way my wife and I were parenting, that it brought back all of this anger and frustration that I had just suppressed, right? That how can you tell me how to parent when you weren't there for me as a child? But if I didn't have kids, I probably would have just moved on and continued to operate in a certain way. But I think that really started to unearth a lot of resentment and things that I had. It was another reason why I needed to finally let that go and do the journeys. Well, you are who your ancestors were waiting for. You are breaking that generational cycle and trauma. So you did your due diligence. So what was your next step? Did you find a retreat somewhere in Central America or did you do it somewhere domestically? What was your first ayahuasca journey like? So luckily, Lisa and I had some friends of ours and one of the couple was a marriage counselor. Mm -hmm. And Lisa had asked the friend, you guys seem so happy and what's the reason that you guys have been able to maintain such a wonderful relationship with yourselves, with your kids. And she said that she and her husband would journey at least once a year, sometimes together, sometimes individually, but that really allowed them to continually heal and cleanse. And it just made their relationship so much better. And so Lisa asked if they could recommend the person. We found that person, they were based in California. And I went and signed up. And I will say the first time I signed up, up until the last minute, I was about to cancel. Mm. But that's kind of how we found it. And I will say that there are a lot of reputable, really diligent, honest guides that will really help do this for the right reasons, because their goal is to also heal humanity. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of others that are now trying to profit off this, are not doing it with the right intentions. And I think that's really important to try to find somebody you trust has already gone through it and do it that way. Yeah, I totally agree. So with your first ceremony, did you do it for two or three nights? Can you go into a little bit of a description of what your actual experience was like once you ingested the medicine? So I chose to go to a retreat where I didn't know anyone else. And since then, I've brought friends of mine with me. But initially, I thought it was really important for me to just go by myself with random strangers and to do this. So it was a two-night journey. I arrived Friday afternoon. You get settled in with 15 to 20 other individuals. And you have a very modest strip of a floor where you bring a mat, sleeping bag, and a pillow and there's a lot of sitting around for a period of time. The guides come through, they take you through it individually. They tell you sort of basic rules, things to do during the ceremony, not to do. If you find yourself getting into any types of problems that they have people there to assist. And then you start the journey. I think we started about eight o'clock at night and it lasted about eight hours. And the first night you're you know, a little anxious because you don't know what to expect. They do this ceremony and then they ask each of you to come up and take a cup of the medicine. You drink it and then you go back and you sit down. And really for about an hour, you're not really feeling much. It's just silent. And then maybe about another hour later, some people you can see they're starting to get under a journey. Others still are not feeling anything. I didn't really feel anything. So then they asked, maybe about two hours later, if you feel moved, come up for a second cup of medicine. So I took a second dose. And then within probably 30 minutes, I was in a deep trip. What was crazy is I was staring out the window. It was sort of nighttime. And the tree limbs that were there all of a sudden started to look like hands and and then I started to look at my hands and I just started to see them shrink. Mm. And all of a sudden it transported me back to being in a crib. Mm -hmm. And basically from my 
full journey for the first time only took me from basically the age of six months to the age of six. I didn't get out of the first six years of my life. So there was a lot of, I think, just personal trauma, abandonment, things of that nature that I had repressed from that time of my life. There was quite a bit of purging for me. I think purging is not only symbolic in the sense that it's meaning you're getting rid of all that crap that's been embedded deep inside of you, but it was powerful in multiple ways. So the first night really just took me back from the age of six months to six years and just the constant experiences of abandonment, of being left to do things that no five or six-year-old kids would ever be asked to do by themselves today. And then the journey ended. for that first night. And after that, you're just wiped out emotionally. There's so many things that you trying to process. The one thing I would say for anybody who's listening that's interested in doing that is to bring a journal. I didn't do that the very first time. So much had flashed through my mind. For me, I was reliving actual experiences that had happened to me as a child. And when I relived them, I clearly remembered them. But you know, some 40 years later, had forgotten entirely. Then the second night, after you've had a chance to try to sleep and just process, you do a journey a second night, and it's different for everybody. I think what happens is what you realize, the more you do these journeys, the more you realize the plant medicines give you exactly what you need at that time. And one of the things that your guide will always say is they want you to come in with an intent. So it can be, I want to find joy, or I want to let go of this suffering or whatever. But ultimately, The medicines will take you where you need the work or the healing at that moment, because if things are so deeply repressed that you've forgotten about them, it's hard to, with the intent, say, I'm going to go back to this, right? Because it's so deeply embedded. So it's pretty powerful. So I just have a question for you about the first journey that you had the first night. What were some of the experiences that were coming up for you from the age of, you said, six months to six years old? And did your mother come through at all in that first night? The first night was purely just me. It was examples of just being abandoned. One was six months in my crib, shivering, crying because I'm so cold. I was born in July and it was summertime and I think the air conditioning was on blasting and nobody was coming in and I was just freezing. And literally, while I'm experiencing that, I am shivering to the point where my teeth are rattling, so cold during this. And then just series of events where a family member took me to an event and just left me there because he got distracted trying to actually pick up a girl. And just one after another, these events of just being left alone. So nobody came to me the first journey. My parents were not there. But the second night, which I thought was the first start of healing, was it took me back to my mom during the war. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I always say about ayahuasca is that unlike, say, therapy, where you spend thousands of dollars and hours on end, and you unleash one thing that happened to you when you were a child, and you have every right to be feel like you were wronged and be angry at that person. Now, like go address it with that person. Right. Ayahuasca takes it one step further because it's all about healing. It's all about restoring sort of this symbiosis that exists between, I think, humanity, our families, our ancestors, as well as the planet. And so it's not designed to just unleash further resentment. So the thing that happened the second night was it took me back to my mom during the Korean War. So my mom was 17 or 18 when the war started. She had a younger brother that is like 12 or 13 years younger than her. And because they were in Seoul and then the bombing came, so then they had to flee. But my grandmother was always very conscious because my mom was of childbearing age that some of the soldiers from the North could take her. So she would always have her, my mom hold my uncle as if it was her own kid. And I think sometimes even pretending she was breastfeeding. So I think that when we were born, because she had never healed from her own generational trauma, 
any intimacy that a normal mom would have with myself or my sister was too traumatic because it reminded her of her pretending to, you know, nurse her own brother. And I think that that's what came to me. So all of a sudden I had such sympathy and compassion for my mom of why she didn't show the type of affection to my sister and I. And now how much of that is really rooted in actual the way it happened or not, nobody knows. But that's, again, what the plant medicines are really designed to do is to try to bring healing to this. So rather than uncovering that my mom was not there for me as a child and going back from the retreat, just being pissed off at my mom, it took it one step further and allowed me to sort of really empathize with, wow, she never healed from any of that. And you need to cut her some slack on this. Did any of your ancestors come through at all? Not so much on the first journey, but on subsequent journeys, grandparents, great grandparents, like that's what I'm saying. The ancestral connection is very, very strong and deep. So a lot of that came through in in subsequent journeys. But the first journey I had really uh, unleashed just so much childhood trauma. And I think it also made me realize how important, how I dealt with my own kids was more so than I ever, I knew that, but it took it to a whole nother level there. How many other subsequent ayahuasca journeys have you done or have you done other psychedelics? So I've done now four uh, ayahuasca journeys and I did do a psilocybin journey, but they call ayahuasca the mother of all for a reason, because it is on a whole nother level than psilocybin. And I really do think Ayahuasca is the one that I would recommend the most. Well, that's like your jam. The ayahuasca really, it really calls to you, right? I mean, I think there's certain plant medicines that call to you at a very specific time in your life. So can you share with me a little bit about the other subsequent journeys that you've had? I'm just so curious about the ancestors coming to you. And did you get any downloads from them, any messages? What were you able to release from those journeys? So I think... One of the things I would say is that some of your listeners may come from traditionally religious backgrounds, right? My dad passed away, but my mom is still a very strong practicing Christian, Mm. born again. And I think the one thing I would say is that this is not like devil's medicine. This is not going to make you disavow your faith. In fact, I've taken a few friends of mine, one is a pastor's son, And it made his connection with his faith even stronger. So that's the first thing I want people to realize, that this is not trying to get people away from their core beliefs. But the one thing I will say that I believe Christianity in the Asian context has done is it's really diminished the role of our ancestors in our lives. So when you look at all the holidays in Korea, right, and even if you go to a Buddhist temple, people are there so often lighting an incense for their ancestors. And on holidays, they'll go visit their ancestors' tombstones and bring rice cakes and alcohol and flowers and really honor their ancestors. And somewhere along the line, I feel like Western religion made it seem like we shouldn't be doing that anymore, or that's no longer important, that now it's just all about your own salvation and things of that nature. And so I grew up in a household where we didn't really honor our ancestors too often. But through this sort of journey, it's really made me much more aware of not just my immediate grandparents, but trying to see great grandparents and multiple generations beyond that. And so I've had some journeys where really, really old ancestors, multi-generational ago, would give me some advice on things, whether it be business, whether it be all sorts of aspects. And I actually reached out to one of my aunts who, before she passed away, was probably the best historian in our family. Did we ever have an uncle in Pyongyang who had a lot of money. And she's like, yeah, actually it was my great uncle and he was legendary. So there are some connections along those lines, but I do think that the subsequent journeys were really more about each time you do this, what you realize is that plant medicines are doing 
the dirty work. They are removing your ego. Initially, it was like, okay, this is all the trauma you went through. This is all of the times you were wronged and you have every right to feel that way. But, you know, are you going to constantly dwell on it or are you going to move forward? Are you going to learn from it? It's made you who you are. And now you can avoid those same mistakes. And you can also show compassion for those people that did that for you. But then each subsequent journey is less about the healing and it's more about making you a better person. And the way they do that is it continues to strip away your ego and point out the areas where, man, you you need to do that better, or you got to stop doing this or things of that nature. So then it starts to shine a real light on yourself each time. And I feel like that just continues to improve yourself. And that's what I think is amazing about it. There are people that do this once a year and they've been doing it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And what they'll tell you is that we're always a constant work in progress, but sometimes early on, it's some deeply rooted trauma and you have a lot more purging. What's great is each time that I've done it, I purge less and sometimes don't purge at all. And yet it takes me to an area that I, it says I just need to have really addressed now. And that's probably something that deep down in your subconscious but your ego is just constantly repressing it, mm-hmm. saying, don't worry about it. Yeah. Whereas when you strip away the ego, it's saying, you know, no, no, you need to address this now. So what were some of the messages or information that your ancestors were sharing with you? And then also, did you experience ego death at any point during your other subsequent ayahuasca journeys? So one time, uh, I'll just say with regard to my relationship with my kids was, so what my girls were younger, they would sleep in the same room in a big, large mattress. And I would lie between them and I'd hold both of their hands and until they fell asleep and then I'd get up. And I had this vision. This time I was an old frail man sitting in a bed and they're holding both my hands as I'm about to pass away. And it was basically saying that if I didn't continue to do the work, I was going to keep all of that poison and stuff inside. And ultimately it was going to eat me up. My dad died of cancer. And I believe that a lot of what, how he died was he just kept all of this emotion and frustration and disappointment with his way his life had turned out inside and it basically ate him up. So that was a real sort of wake up call to me is that you need to keep doing this work. Otherwise you're going to suffer a similar fate. And that's going to be your daughters holding your hands which was a pretty profound moment for me. It was really very emotional, very traumatic, but like it shook me to say, your work is not done. You got to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. As far as ancestors that came to me, some were there to just tell me about how to be careful of things in business, to not get too caught up in the pursuit of success. Stay true to who you are. Don't compromise. And that's really what the uncle was telling me is like, you have a potential to have tremendous success, but do not let the money or the monetary gains really corrupt who you are at your core. So interesting. I wholeheartedly believe that your body holds on to everything. And so if that energy that you're holding on to doesn't get released in some way, it will manifest, whether it's some sort of chronic disease or cancer or physically in some way. Absolutely. I think... Uh, having treated cancer patients for 20 years, I can tell you a lot of them had kept such deep rooted crap inside and it just ate them away. It literally was a cancer inside. A thousand percent. I totally agree. So growing up as a Christian, do you find that you became more spiritual after these experiences with ayahuasca? So I will say that my parents found their faith, even though Christianity has been multi-generational in our family, my dad's grandmother was an elder at Yangnak in Pyongyang. So it goes back, we're talking early, early, late 1800s, early 1900s. My parents didn't force my sister and I to go to church as youngsters. Part of it was because I think, again, they were dealing with their own generational trauma. They had fallen away from the church. So we were not really raised in any religion. My parents found their faith later in their lives, I think in their 60s. And this is the single most important thing for them. For me, I do think the plant medicines has given me a greater appreciation of how we're all connected in this world, right? And how the indigenous people knew all along the way to heal themselves or society. 
And so when you think of all the way the plants heal our world, right, they suck all the carbon dioxide out of the air and they convert it into oxygen. And how as we destroy the planet, destroy the Amazon, <clears throat> how our world is really. And then on top of that, they give us these incredible plant medicines that can really bring about healing. So in the sense that I've become much more, I would say, worldly or spiritual in, in that sense, that there's such an interconnection between our humanity and our world. And I also feel like if we were able to have ayahuasca, these plant medicines, we could heal so much of the trauma division in our world. When I look at the Middle East conflict and I see the constant battles in the West Bank between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and I think, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to heal people through this? Because I do see people who have not connected over years because of that coming back together. What was amazing about these journeys is that you would see people bring their brother they hadn't talked to in 20 years or their mom and the real healing that happened, even though you're on your own individual journey afterwards, how the universe just brings these people back together. It's really like no other phenomena that you can really explain. How is it for you being a doctor, knowing what traditional Western medicine views in terms of these medicines and spirituality, the esoteric? Like, how do you reconcile having had these experiences and knowing that there really is something much greater than us and that we are all connected and that, like you said, holistically, your body, everything is so connected. It's not separate from anything. Like, how do you reconcile the spirituality part with being very scientific minded and being a doctor? Well, again, I think it's the realization that we don't know everything, that doctors are still know what they were taught in medical school, but that we as individuals have to constantly learn and evolve. And so I've been very, very outspoken about how I believe these plant medicines, and they are a medicine, can help and really heal people in a way that the pharmaceutical industry can't, right? So I've had lots of doctors that I've sort of preached the ayahuasca gospel to, Many of them have gone on to do the journeys and they are now turning their friends and families on. And I think a lot of people have been closeted about doing these journeys because it's still been considered illegal in many states, but you're seeing more and more countries and states begin to legalize the use of psychedelics. Yes. And you're starting to see Johns Hopkins and Columbia and Harvard doing these incredible studies showing the real benefits of uh, psychedelics in healing everything from depression to all sorts of uh, post-traumatic stress. So I think now the science is starting to catch up in terms of understanding why these plant medicines are doing what they're doing. That's why I think your mission to tell these stories is so important. It needs to be out there. People need to understand. We need to really dispel all the stigma that this is just some hippie, wacky, tacky, you know. Timothy uh, Leary. <laughs> exactly. But even Timothy Leary was onto something. I think now in the long run, he's going to be vindicated. Yes. And Michael Pollan with his book on plant medicines, there's more and more great science that is being revealed to people on this. So for me, I just couldn't be silent. I needed to speak more and more. And fortunately, it's being legalized more and more places. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be closeted to talk about it anymore. I have so much hope. Even a couple of weeks ago when they had the psychedelic science conference in Colorado, Aaron Rodgers, you know, openly talks about that he's done ayahuasca and psilocybin. John Mackey, the co-founder of Whole Foods, he's finally coming out of the psychedelic closet. It gives me so much hope that these people are coming out and openly saying the experiences have completely changed them in such a profound way. You can't ignore it anymore. So uh, absolutely. You, I mean, how did you integrate or reintegrate into this very dense 3D reality? How did you reintegrate when you came back from the two ceremonies and then the other subsequent ones? Was it something that you did with a the therapist or did you just kind of slowly reintegrate on your own? I really attribute this to our guides for the journey. They really took us through things to do and don't during your integration. I think the biggest mistake a lot of people do is they dive right back into their full schedule, not really 
aware of how traumatic the experience was. And so I do think it is important to slowly integrate. The first time I did it, I didn't, I went back and you come home, your kids are waiting for you and you're getting right back into it. But there was a certain joy that I had being in that moment that I could really appreciate that time together that maybe other times I was so distracted that I didn't fully realize. One of my friends that I took on a journey for the first time, it was the weekend of Father's Day. Mm -hmm. He had profound breakthroughs and we got back Sunday morning and he spent all day with his kids for Father's Day. And he said that was probably the most meaningful Father's Day he'd ever had. I do think sometimes people make the mistake to get back into their daily grind too quickly, particularly if it's after the first journey. But I find that with each journey, the time to really digest and integrate is less and less. Mm -hmm. Because again, you've done a lot of the work beforehand. So it's less jarring to just go back into the real world. Did you feel like you had a little bit of a halo effect for a few months or a few weeks after you came back from the ceremony? Did you feel like your heart opened? Yeah, I think it definitely opened. It took away some of the anger that I had. Occasionally, uh, I think it's very Korean, right? The lash out gene. And I think some of that is just learned behavior from seeing our parents or somebody lash out. I think to say that you solve all of your problems or <clears throat> you become this perfect citizen afterwards is not true. I think it's easy to fall back into the habits that you've had for your whole life. But I do find that's when I start to realize I need to go back and do another journey. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, each time I think you end up uh, coming out a better version of yourself than you were before. And that each time you're much more aware of those things that can potentially trigger you and why you are acting the way you are. And I think that's been very, very helpful for me. I think it's definitely improved my relationships with my wife, my kids, with just how I view people in general. It also makes me realize that I don't have to be angry all the time, right? Mm -hmm. That those things that we endured as kids, that that's maybe part of the reason we lash out the way we do sometimes. Yeah. There's ne less need to lash out and you catch yourself more frequently than maybe you did in the past. We're always works in progress. The joke is once in a while, if I'm starting to revert back to certain things, my wife or I will say to each other, maybe it's time for me to go back and do another journey. Mm -hmm. I think the whole goal is you constantly need to put in the work. <clears throat> so what's your relationship like with your mom? Did you talk to her about your journeys or what you kind of uncovered, especially about her? We've had some frank discussions. I've explained to her how I think a lot of resentment started to surface again, because as I say, pre-kids, I just kind of put it in the back of my mind and forgotten about it. And I think we were operating at a really good level. But I do think once we had kids, it really started to unleash all of the things that she and my dad didn't do for my sister and I. So I was very frank with her. And I said, you know, mom, I'm really sorry that I get very frustrated with you. But it's really hard when you come over and I know you're trying to be helpful. But at the same time, you're criticizing Lisa and I in terms of our parenting when you and dad were so absent for us. Yeah. It's almost like, what nerve? Did you forget that you didn't even do any of that? So I think I had that frank discussion. She understood it. She actually apologized. And I think she realized now that there was a lot of trauma. But I also, again, have to put in the context of she's 91 now, and I need to actually do a better job of really implementing the things that I learned that there's this trauma from the war, the PTSD that I don't think she ever had a chance to heal from. Well, you know, there's this therapy called family constellation therapy. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but you go into a room and there's other people there, nobody from your immediate family at all, but other people who represent members of your family. And I don't know the entire process. I have friends who've done it, but they said that they have felt a huge shift energetically just within themselves, but then also with members of their family 
when they were done with the session. It just proves that energetically we're all connected in some way. So if you're healing yourself and you're healing those generational traumas that hopefully your mother at some point, maybe she'll benefit a little bit from that. It's really a gift, these plant medicines. So for you, what's next? You've done these plant medicine journeys. Is this something that you want to try and integrate on a professional level, knowing what the benefits are and how much you can really help people? Well, I actually have not been practicing as an oncologist for a couple of years. I started a biotech company, but I do see real benefit even in patients with terminal cancer, Mm -hmm. how there's actually been studies that shown that this has really helped give them a much better sense of their current situation, that this isn't the end all, that there's a lot of real joy for the last parts of their lives. What I just am trying to do is just one by one spread the plant medicine gospel that I think everyone can benefit from this, that it is not something that is crazy and that there's a real healing that can be brought about. So I've taken lots of fellow dads and friends to do this journey. I've tried to recommend anyone who's ever interested the reason to do it. And that's what I've been doing more on a one by one personal appeal. But I've also been very outspoken about, I think, how this can really benefit humanity and individuals and their families. If everyone was able to do this, Mm. think of how much more healing there would be, how less anger there would be. And just in terms of how we as a society could move on, because if you're carrying all this crap inside of you for so long, it's really hard for you to fully use all of the energy you need to move forward. Do you feel like you're being called to be a healer potentially, or maybe even a shaman at some point? No, that I don't. I I will say this. The people that do these ceremonies, especially when you find somebody who's really in it for the right reasons, has spent the years studying in the rainforest or in Peru, and just the amount of gifts that that person has been given to do this work you realize that's really a calling. Now, the one thing I think the viewers may not realize is that the shaman or the guide of your ceremony, they're taking the plant medicines too. Matter of fact, all of the people that are assisting, they're under the trance in much the same way. And so the energy is collective in the room. And what I realize is why I like doing it with strangers is you soon realize that everyone in that room was called there for that reason and brought together for a reason. And that there's certain things that they'll share that will make your experience richer. And at the same time, the music, the cadence, they know just when the right time is to go with some beautiful, melodic, mellow, angelic tune. And then other times where it's more upbeat with more drums, but all of the music is just a whole nother level. It's just incredible. But that you realize that those people that are doing that have really been called to do that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. So can I ask you, you talked a little bit about your relationship with your mother. How is your relationship with your wife and your kids? How has that changed for you? In what ways has it changed? I I think just in terms of how to express emotion, I think in terms of how to not transfer frustration or anger that may be rightfully directed at somebody else, how to prevent transferring that to the people closest, because I think just the way, not just Asians, but people operate are you usually take it out on the people that are the closest to you and maybe deserve it the least. Right. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it has allowed me to be much more aware of that. Now, are there moments where I still have a relapse? Sure. Look, we're all human, but I do think just being aware of that has improved my relationship with my entire family. And I think that being able to share emotions, to just be able to share what's in your heart, it has also been something that I had not been able to do up until recently, since I started doing the plant medicine. So some of the vulnerabilities that you feel, one example was my oldest daughter had a habit of probably at the age of six or seven, starting to tell lies. And one of the things that came to me was, when did I start to lie as a kid? And part of that was my parents were never around, right? So I would go to 
ride my bicycle clear across town to go to practice. And then games, my dad was never there. So people would ask, where's your dad? How come he can't come? And I would make up some excuse that he was working. And that's when I started to realize that I justify it was okay to lie. And then how once you tell one lie, then you can start to tell others. And I was able to use that story to really highlight to my oldest daughter that it's not okay to lie, that you don't need to lie. You can always just say what's the truth and move forward. So even things like that, I think I can incorporate into my relationships with my own kids. And I do think that's just led for healthier relationships in general. So Paul, if you could give any final thoughts for somebody who's potentially researching and considering doing a journey with psychedelics, what would be your advice for them? One, I would absolutely tell everyone this is well worth it. The second thing I would say is that if you start to talk about it, chances are somebody that you know and trust will divulge to you that they have done it at some point and that they will have somebody that they uh, had a positive experience with that they can recommend to you. I would be very careful. You don't have to go spend thousands of dollars to fly to Peru and go to those retreats. Now, some of them are great and reputable, but I do think there are people that are well-trained, have spent the time to really learn the craft and are called to do this that are local. And there is a growing network of people that can do this. So one, I think everyone should do it. I'm just going to be blunt. This is something that even if you think you have all your shit together, it's only going to make you even better. I would just say everyone should really strongly do this, but then try to find somebody that has used and uh, had a positive experience with. Also, I would say that if someone's charging you some exorbitant amount of money, then that's also a warning sign. The retreats that I have been a part of have ranged from anywhere from $800 to $1,000 top, which is what the cost of two or three therapy sessions in Manhattan, right? And so they shouldn't have to be exorbitant in terms of cost. And high cost doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the best experience either. It's probably the people who think they have their shit together are probably the ones who actually need it the most, right? No judgment, but I'm just putting it out there. (laughs) Uh, It's so true. And again, the one thing I keep realizing the more I do this is that the more you do it, the more it strips away your ego and the more it just sheds a light on those areas where you, you need work. Yeah. I mean, we think we know it all, but we really know nothing. At the end of the day, when you do these plan meetings, you come out, you're like, I know nothing. <laughs> a- absolutely. Absolutely. But that's what's great. And then I think the more we all do this, the more we'll realize how we are all very much connected, not only to humanity, but to our planet. Mm-hmm. Oh, so true. Well, that is such a beautiful way to end this conversation. Paul, thank you so much again. It's been such a treat to talk to you, to get to know you. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really, really appreciate it. Well, it's it's my pleasure. And thank you for doing this and caring enough to try to help our humanity. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Your support means a lot to me. So please subscribe, download, and share with friends and family. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. So let me know what resonates for you. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care. Eh.